this is like no big deal, we're totally overreacting. And the other half of the time it's like, this is terrible, we're, we're all gonna die, or I'm gonna die. Hey there, friends. I know uh, we haven't seen each other in a while, but um, I guess things aren't going exactly according to plan. Hmm. The new cliche greeting or the, in all emails is like, oh, I hope you're doing well during these strange times. Excluding leaving her. My bat just beeping like crazy. Since we haven't seen each other in, in a while now, and it seems like it's gonna be another while before we see each other, I figured we'd, we'd hang out a bit uh, this way. Feel free to just leave this plane in the background, put it on mute, or if you can't stand me, I mean, obviously just turn the video off or whatever, skip it. For those of you who are happy to see me, I'm happy to see you too. I'm actually happy to see anybody right now from afar. Yeah, I don't, I don't know, it's a strange time and it, it gets you, it gets you thinking about a bunch of things. Uh, going from, I uh, cut my, my nails earlier. Okay, not extreme paranoia, but let's say mild paranoia and anxiety to being totally relaxed and, but it's just there's so many things going on in your head. It's like your head is filled up with so much information, and so many different thoughts. that it's kind of tricky to be like, oh, I'm gonna be super focused and uh, just carry on doing things as if everything were normal. <laughs> I was thinking a lot about Anton Artaud, who is this great uh, French, I call him character. I mean, I know he's known as maybe as a playwright and people are always talking about the theater of cruelty. I really didn't, I mean, I used to know what it was. I don't really know what it is anymore. I've kind of, when I was in my 20s, I was like devouring all the information that I could and as you get older. <laughs> yeah, I guess one of those things that I devoured back in my early 20s kind of came floating up to the the surface. He starts the book talking about the plague and it's really kind of a really amazing dissection of human psychology. I'll, I'll, I'll just dive in. I will be a lot more eloquent now because I will obviously be reading text by a master and not just me babbling. Should have brought some water. Oh, anyway, so he's talking about the plague and I'm going to skip the first one or two paragraphs and he says, beneath such a scourge all social forms disintegrate. Order collapses. He observes every infringement of morality every psychological disaster. He hears his body fluids murmuring within him, torn, failing in a dizzying collapse of tissue. His organs grow heavy and gradually turn to carbon. But is it too late to avert the scourge? Even destroyed, even annihilated, organically pulverized and consumed to his very marrow, he knows we do not die in our dreams, that our will operates even in absurdity, even in the negation of possibility, even in the transmutation of the lies from which truth can be remade. So I don't know if this applies to us when we're running out like crazy to get all the toilet paper, but I don't know, it's kind of like this beautiful poetic passage and I really like how he's describing like this horrific thing happening to the body, but there's still the possibility or like the power of the will. Whatever may be the errors of historians or physicians concerning the plague, I believe we can agree upon the idea of a malady that would be a kind of psychic entity and would not be carried by a virus. If one wished to analyze closely all the facts of plague contagion that history or even memoirs provide us, it would be difficult to isolate one actually verified instance of contagion by contact. And Boccaccio's example of a swine that died from having sniffed the sheets in which plague victims had been wrapped scarcely suggests more than a kind of mysterious affinity between pig and the nature of the plague which again would have to be very closely analyzed. Although there exists no concept of an actual morbid entity, there are some forms upon which the mind can provisionally agree as characterizing certain phenomena, and it seems that the mind can agree to a plague described in the following manner. Before the onset of any very marked physical or psychological discomfort, the body is covered with red spots which the victim suddenly notices only when they turn blackish. The victim scarcely hesitates to become alarmed before his head begins to boil and to grow overpoweringly heavy, and he collapses. Then he is seized by a terrible fatigue, the fatigue of a centralized magnetic suction, of his molecules divided and drawn toward their annihilation. His crazed body fluids, unsettled and commingled, seem to be flooding through his flesh. His gorge rises, the inside of his stomach seems as if it were trying to gush out between his teeth. His pulse, which at times slows down to a shadow of itself. Hello, hello. Oh, sorry, just, just hearing weird sounds. Because uh, the light reading is making me maybe a bit paranoid. It doesn't really relate to, what, to what's going on because also like our scientific understanding is much more advanced than the time Artaud was, was, was writing this book. 
But nevertheless, it's, it's very interesting that there still is this kind of unknowing uncertainty. And in that liminal space, there's some very interesting reflections to, to be made. This is, I think, more speaking to the, like philosophy and art more so than a practical solution to the matter at hand. But nevertheless, I'll, I'll, I'll share this with you. Hello, hello. In 1880 or so, a French doctor by the name of Yersin, Yersin, yeah, working on some cadavers of Indo-Chinese natives who had died of the plague, isolated one of those round-headed, short-tailed tadpoles which only the microscope can reveal and called it the plague microbe. Personally, I regard this microbe only as a smaller, infinitely smaller material element which appears at some moment in the development of the virus, but which in no way accounts for the plague. And I should like this doctor to tell me why all the great plagues, with or without virus, have a duration of five months, after which their virulence abates, and how the Turkish ambassador, who was passing through Languedoc, Languedoc? I always see this with wine and I never pause to think how you would pronounce it. I imagine you pronounce the C at the end, Languedoc. Towards the end of 1720, was able to draw an imaginary line from Nice through Avignon and Toulouse to Bordeaux, marking the limit of the scourge's geographical extent. Jeez, Arto. A line which events proved to be accurate, so basically a division in this plague. From all this emerges the spiritual physiognomy of a disease whose laws cannot be precisely defined and whose geographical origin it would be idiotic to attempt to determine. For the Egyptian plague is not the Oriental plague, which is not described by Hippocrates, which is not that of Syracuse, nor of Florence, nor the Black Death, which accounted for 50 million lives in medieval Europe. No one can say why the plague strikes the coward who flees it and spares the degenerate who gratifies himself on the corpses. Such an Arthur thing to say. You have to pause there for a second. I, I, I'm going to reread it. No one can say why the plague strikes the coward who flees it and spares the degenerate who gratifies himself on the corpses. Why distance, chastity, solitude are helpless against the attacks of the scourge. And why a group of debauchees, isolating themselves in the country, like Boccaccio, with his two well-stocked companions and seven women, as lustful as they were religious, can calmly wait for the warm days when the plague withdraws. And why, in a nearby castle transformed into a citadel, with a cordon of armed men to forbid all entry, the plague turns the garrison and all the occupants into corpses and spares only the armed men exposed to contagion. So, I mean, this working force that we have, fear not, Artaud uh, has your back with this beautiful description. Who can also explain why the military cordon sanitaire, which Mehemet Ali established toward the end of the last century on the occasion of an outbreak of the Egyptian plague, effectively protected convents, schools, prisons, and palaces, and why numerous epidemics of a plague, with all the characteristic symptoms of Oriental plague, could suddenly break out in medieval Europe in places having no contact whatever with the Orient. From these peculiarities, these mysteries, these contradictions, and these symptoms, we must construct the spiritual physiognomy of a disease which progressively destroys the organism like a pain which, as it intensifies and deepens, multiplies its resources and means of access at entry level of the sensibility. But from this spiritual freedom with which the plague develops, without rats, without microbes, and without contact, can be deduced the somber and absolute action of a spectacle which I shall attempt to analyze. Once the plague is established in the city, the regular forms collapse. There is no maintenance of roads and sewers, no army, no police, no municipal administration. Pyres are lit at random to burn the dead, with whatever means are available. Each family wants to have its own, then wood, space, and flame itself growing rare. There are family feuds around the pyres, soon followed by general flight, for the corpses are too numerous. The dead already clog the streets in ragged pyramids, gnawed at by animals around the edges. The stench rises in the air like a flame. Entire streets are blocked by the piles of dead. Then the houses open, and the delirious victims, their minds crowded with hideous visions, spread howling through the streets. The disease that ferments in their viscera and circulates throughout the entire organism discharges itself in tremendous cerebral explosions. Other victims, without bubbles, delirium, pain, or rash, examine themselves proudly in the mirror, in splendid health, as they think and then fall dead with their shaving mugs in their hands, full of scorn for other victims. Yeah, I, I don't know why I chose to read <laughs> this right now, because it's, uh, I mean, I guess it's so much more extreme that maybe it helps put things into perspective. Over the poisonous, thick, bloody streams, 
color of agony and opium, which gush out of the corpses. Strange personages pass, dressed in wax, with noses long as sausages and eyes of glass, mounted on a kind of Japanese sandal made of double wooden tablets, one horizontal in the form of a soul, the other vertical to keep them from contaminated fluids, chanting absurd litanies that cannot prevent them from sinking into the furnace in their turn. These ignorant doctors betray only their fear and their childishness. The dregs of the population, apparently immunized by their frenzied greed, enter the open houses and pillage riches they know will serve no purpose or profit. And at the moment, the theater is born. The theater, an immediate gratuitousness provoking acts without use or profit. I mean, I don't know how fitting it is to, to read this now, and I don't know if it's, I mean, if you're even, if you've even gotten this far along with me, I hope it's not going to make you all paranoid when it gets darker. I mean, it's pretty gray out right now, so it's not going to change that much by nightfall. It's quite interesting, I think. The last of the living are in a frenzy. The obedient and virtuous son kills his father. The chaste man performs sodomy upon his neighbors. The lecher becomes pure. The miser throws his gold in handfuls out the window. The warrior hero sets fire to the city he once risked his life to save. The dandy decks himself out in his finest clothes and promenades before the charnel houses. Neither the idea of an absence of sanctions nor that of imminent death suffices to motivate acts so gratuitously absurd on the part of men who did not believe death could end anything. And how explain the surge of erotic fever among the recovered victims who, instead of fleeing the city, remain where they are, trying to wrench a criminal pleasure from the dying or even the dead, half crushed under the pile of corpses where chance has lodged them. But if a mighty scourge is required to make this frenetic gratuitousness show itself, and if this scourge is called the plague, then perhaps we can determine the value of this gratuitousness in relation to our total personality. The state of the victim who dies without material destruction, with all the stigmata of an absolute and almost abstract disease upon him, is identical with the state of an actor entirely penetrated by fear feelings that do not benefit or even relate to his real condition. Everything in the physical aspect of the actor, as in that of the victim of the plague, shows that life has reacted to the paroxysm and yet nothing has happened. <laughs> Fucking genius. Huh? Anyway, I mean, that went way too far, but maybe we'll, we'll see each other again for uh, our second reading session. I'll continue reading a bit of uh, the brilliant Artaud. Good seeing you. I mean, I'm not really seeing you, but uh, just put that out there because uh, I mean, I have a bunch of work to do, but I decided to do this instead. Also because Claudine went out of the house for a bit on her bike to an empty studio where she's going to film a class by herself for the people. Um, so trying to keep uh, safe and respect uh, the consigne. What's the term for that in English? Have to. It's brilliant stuff. I was kind of scared to plunge into it because I remember there being pretty graphic uh, depictions of disease and it's kind of like the last thing. When it's, when it's put intelligently and creatively, it highlights something of what is beautiful of the human spirit. And I feel that that's something that's very important to, to encounter during times such, such as this, because it's very easy to be distracted, overwhelmed. Everybody has their, their own way of, of dealing with things, and everybody, I think, is going through ups and downs in different ways, so we just have to find a way to, okay, if I want to be very nice and optimistic, care for each other, but put up with with each other. For example, me, I'm doing these random things that I normally wouldn't wouldn't really do. Um, I mean, I wish I had my, my partner for my channel here, um, for Channel Tatum. I don't know if anybody has heard about this, but uh, this great lifestyle vlog that had started back in Germany with um, my dear friend, but different circumstances prevented us from uh, continuing the production of, uh, of this lifestyle vlog, which was uh, getting rave reviews already. This uh, Herr Gastenberg got in the way a bit. But anyway, it's a bit of an inside inside joke. Life continues throwing these, these, these things at us. But uh, I don't know, I quite enjoyed it. Uh, reading. I, had, I hadn't read, just stopped to read something in such a long time because I was so caught up in work and going out and to work. Right now I'm just kind of forcing myself to not be alienated in work, so I apologize to anybody who I need to deliver work to who might see this. So, yeah. Oh, and in case anybody was wondering, and it's a very fair uh, doubt to have, I am wearing pants.